It has stood the test of time. God's Book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. I'm John Bradshaw and this is It Is Written. Thanks for joining me today. I'm here behind the G.A.R. Hall, the oldest church building in the city of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It was built in 1822 by Methodists. It was the first church in this area to allow blacks and whites to worship together. The church is still in use today. In 1863, during and after the Battle of Gettysburg, most public buildings and most church buildings were pressed into emergency service. Many college buildings, seminary buildings, even private homes were converted into hospitals to take care of the many wounded and dying. Behind the GAR Hall here, you find this, this little cemetery. There's no shortage of cemeteries in Gettysburg, and that's because so many people died in battle. During the course of the American Civil War, more than 700,000 soldiers died, almost 8,000 alone during this one battle here and more following the battle. If you plan to make a trip to come and visit Gettysburg and you do a little bit of research, you're probably going to discover this interesting fact. The number one money-making tourism enterprise in Gettysburg is ghost tours. In fact, one company that operates ghost tours here in Gettysburg has this to say on its website. Of all the forlorn countless souls awash in time, none reach out to us more than those of the dead at Gettysburg. They were young men mostly, with hopes for a bright future, and moved by sincere patriotic dreams, caught up and cruelly thrown down again in that great hot whirl of mortal combat. Their presence on earth was silenced forever by death. Or maybe not. So what's really going on here? Are the ghosts of dead soldiers really wandering around Gettysburg? Lost in some sort of purgatory? And if they are, what stranded them here? Was it the tragedy of war? Or was it, as the website says, their intense desire for a bright future. And did nobody tell them that the Battle of Gettysburg ended a century and a half ago? When it comes to the subject of what happens to the dead, the only place you can go to for reliable answers is the Word of God. It's the only thing we can really trust. The ghosts of Gettysburg. I'll have more in just a moment. In Matthew 4.4, the Word of God says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every Word is a one-minute Bible-based daily devotional presented by Pastor John Bradshaw and designed especially for busy people like you. Look for Every Word on selected networks or watch it online every day on our website, itiswritten.com. Receive a daily spiritual boost. Watch Every Word. You'll be glad you did. Here's a sample. Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert, was on a railway platform in Jersey City, New Jersey, when he slipped between the platform and a moving train. But someone behind him grabbed his coat collar and lifted him to safety on the platform, saving him from serious injury and possibly death. The man who saved young Robert Lincoln was Edwin Booth, the brother of John Wilkes Booth, who later murdered President Lincoln. The brother of Lincoln's assassin saved Lincoln's son. Coincidence? Well, you decide. But when God is at work in our lives, that's providence. Ecclesiastes 11.5 says, As you do not know what is the way of the wind, or how the bones grow in the womb of her who is with child, so you do not know the works of God who makes everything. Even when you don't see it, God is at work. Where some see coincidence, you can know God was there. Let's live today by every word. Today, we're talking about the ghosts of Gettysburg. The idea of people dying and leaving spirits here on the earth to wander 
to and fro is an old idea. As a matter of fact, people have been believing in ghosts since before human beings started leaving written records. Today, most people fall into one or the other of two main camps when it comes to this question of what happens when you die. Many people believe that when you die, you go straight to heaven or straight to hell or perhaps purgatory. In other words, you survive bodily death. You go on living after you die. And then there's a school of thought that says that when you die, your spirit goes back to God, but your hopes and dreams and thoughts and desires and aspirations all cease to be. As Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 5, the dead know not anything. Well, whatever you believe about that, there's one thing everybody ought to be able to agree on, and that's this, that when you die, you don't leave a spirit behind that roams the earth. The dead don't come back to visit their families or haunt houses. In the Bible, the only spirit beings that roamed the earth, at least in the Old Testament, were angels. Interestingly, even in the Bible, there were people who believed in ghosts. Let's consider a New Testament story. We get it from Matthew chapter 14, verses 25 and 26. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. Did I read that right? Did the disciples actually believe in ghosts? The ones who spent many of their waking days, in fact, every day for several years with Jesus, the divine son of God. Did these guys believe in ghosts? Evidently so. And it wasn't just the disciples who believed this either. There's a very curious story found in the Old Testament concerning a man named Saul. That is, King Saul, the king of Israel. King Saul believed that he had an encounter with a ghost as well. You find the story in 1 Samuel chapter 28. And the fact is, it's the only real ghost story that you find in the Bible. Understanding this story gives us some real insight into the supernatural. Let's pick it up in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 8. So Saul disguised himself and put on other clothes, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, Please conduct a seance for me, and bring up for me the one I shall name to you. Then the woman said to him, Look, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Interesting, isn't it? Now, the question we want to ask ourselves is this. Was that actually the ghost of Samuel? Evidently looked like Samuel, apparently talked like Samuel. This Samuel figure evidently recognized Saul, and Samuel wasn't too happy about having been brought back from the dead. So how do we understand this? First thing you want to do is consider the context in which this took place. King Saul was talking to a medium, and this was something that God had expressly forbidden his people from doing. Leviticus 19.31 Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And then we read this in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 13. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, 
or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. And then Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 6. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Spiritualism is one of Satan's most overwhelming and most effective deceptions. And it was cooked up in the theological seminaries of hell itself. There's no question something was going on. And what was going on was this. Saul the king was speaking to the medium and the medium was communicating with the devil. It's important that we know this, especially in this world where psychics are big business and mediums have their own television programs. It wasn't that long ago that a cable TV channel came here to Gettysburg and they filmed the show on paranormal activity in Gettysburg. They brought high-tech electronic equipment that they hoped was going to help them capture communication with spirits from the other side. How successful were they in doing so? Well, you and I both know. People say Gettysburg is haunted. People refer to hearing strange things and seeing odd things from time to time. Activity they can't really adequately explain. But you know, that's true for just about anywhere in the United States. You hear something, you see something. If you hadn't been told that there are spirits roaming around, you'd never have even thought it was a spirit. You'd have thought that noise in your, uh, in your attic was a raccoon. You wouldn't have been worried about some departed Gettysburg soldier. It is said that Gettysburg is the most haunted place in the United States. True or false? Well, it's true that it's said that, but I think we both know why it is said. You know why? Because it's good for business. That's why. Now, God does have a means of assisting those of us living on the earth, even sometimes communicating with us here on the earth. How does God do that supernaturally? One, through the Holy Spirit. Two, through the Word of God. And three, through angels. One thing that's consistent in the Bible about angels is that when angels interact with human beings, they have this tremendous capacity to be able to fill human beings with awe. They are awe-inspiring. I'll share with you a couple of verses from the Bible that make that point very, very clear. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 5. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. These are the women who came down to Jesus' tomb. The angel appeared and they were awestruck. Now the word used is fear. And I've got to be honest with you and tell you that I'm not sure how much terror filled these people as much as wonder and awe, a heavenly being. We're in the presence of somebody who has come from God. They didn't have to be terrified of God, but I tell you, they were, they were, the word is not inappropriate anyhow. They were afraid, they were awestruck. I'll give you another verse that makes the same point and we'll discuss a couple of others again. Luke 1 verse 12, when Zacharias, that's the father of John the Baptist, saw him, the angel, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. So the angels of heaven have this ability to instill fear or inspire awe in those people who encounter the angels of heaven. You read in Daniel chapter 8, Daniel said when the angel appeared to him, he was afraid and he fell on his face. So point number one, angels inspire, let's say fear or awe. You choose which word works best for you. Point number two, angels are powerful. I want to share a little story with you from Isaiah chapter 37. How powerful are the angels? Well, let's look at this. At Gettysburg in 1863, Battle of Gettysburg ended with 8,000 or thereabouts deaths. Many more casualties when you take into account the wounded and the missing and so on. And then about another 8,000 people died shortly after the Battle of Gettysburg. And it's interesting to just say that as though it's of no consequence, but it was of colossal consequence. 
Then you had the Battle of Antietam, the bloodiest single day in the history of the American Civil War. But look at this, how powerful is an angel of heaven. I'll read in Isaiah chapter 37, starting in verse 33. Listen to this. God says, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend the city to save it for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. And then what did God do? God commissioned an angel who went forth and, well, let's read. Let's read and see what happens in verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went forth and smote the camp of the Assyrians, a hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. One angel, so powerful that 185,000 soldiers were killed in one fell swoop. How powerful are the angels of God? They're tremendously powerful. Now there's another point I want you to look at uh, concerning the angels of heaven, God's messengers sent to this earth, and that's this. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 13, He, the king, said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent their horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servants said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the angels appeared as brilliant beings. What a display to see the mountain full of horses and chariots of fire sent from God and angels. The Word of God said a great host was there. How impressive that must have been to the view of Elisha's servant to walk out there and look out and see what God had sent, all sent by God to assist and aid and help God's people and bring encouragement and assure God's people that he was with them. God was there with his people. And the angel appeared, the angels appeared as messengers of God to bring strength and hope. Now, about the way angels appear. The Word of God makes clear that angels are able to assume other forms. Now, here's what I mean by that. I'll give you a couple of very biblical examples. In the New Testament, the Word of God says that Satan is able to appear as an angel of light. Now, he's an angel of darkness. He's the devil. Nevertheless, he can disguise himself in such a way as he can appear to be an angel of goodness, an angel of light. Let's get an even more graphic example than that. We go back to Genesis, the creation story, just after the creation story, and Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, and, and so on. The devil appeared as a snake. Must have been a very beautiful creature because Eve was enticed, she was beguiled, she was drawn, she was attracted to what was taking place. Now maybe there's something about a talking snake. A little hard for me to relate to because I was raised in one of the very few countries in the world where there are no snakes. There's only three of them and I was raised in one of those three countries. No snakes at all. I wasn't raised with any affinity for snakes in any way, shape or form. Now I've developed a working toleration with them. 
I can't imagine what I would ever have done if I'd heard a talking snake. I'd like to think that I wouldn't have hung around. Eve heard the voice, looked and saw the snake, the serpent. It must have been a beautiful creature and she entered into a discussion with it. And where did that discussion lead? It led to where we are today, plunged into misery and sin in the depths of despair as a planet, hoping for a better day. And we know that better day is the return of Jesus. Lucifer, now Satan, changed his form. And he did that to draw Eve and Adam and this whole planet into the depths of the misery of sin. Now, there's another point I want to make about angels, and that's this. You know, God created us in such a way that we can be inhabited. Yeah, the Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We were created to be filled with the presence of God. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and that person will dine with me. Jesus wants to come into us and live his life in us. We read that again and again and again in the Word of God. We were made to be inhabited. However, you've also read in the Word of God that there are people who have been inhabited by the wrong spirit. And there are probably several places we could go in the Bible to illustrate that, but I want to go to Luke chapter 11. And there's an interesting passage in Luke chapter 11 that demonstrates this. Luke chapter 11, I'm going to read in verse 24 and on. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, and finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then he goes and he takes to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than his first. Isn't that something? You see, we were made to be inhabited, inhabited by a spirit. God is a spirit, and that's who we want to fill us up. Jesus wants to live his life in us, and he would do that today through the Holy Spirit. But if we are not filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to be filled with something. Notice. The demon was cast out or went out of a man. He came back to that person and found the man empty, empty. And because he was empty, there was room inside that person's mind or heart or life for that demon and many of his associates. We were made to be filled up. We were made to be filled with the Spirit of God. However, if we are not, we can be filled with the spirit of Satan. We can be filled with demons. People can be possessed. You know, that's one of the reasons why it's so very, very important not to go to mediums, not to consult mediums, not to deal with psychics, to stay away from psychic phenomena, to stay away from that dangerous, unbiblical, uh, paranormal activity. Why? Because it's not of God. And if you will give the enemy of souls a toehold, he'll take it. If you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. If you give him access to your life at all, before you know it, He's taken over your life completely. The only safe thing to do is to stay away from that dark side, to stay away from the mediums and the psychics, to stay away from the ghosts and the ghost stories, and run to Jesus and hang on to Jesus and just don't let go. You can't always explain things that go bump in the night, except you can know this. The devil is a liar. Jesus called him the father of lies. And to get a world full of people to believe that the spirits of the dead come back to the earth and roam the streets and haunt houses, really that's quite an achievement, especially when the Bible says plainly and simply in the book of Job chapter 7 that the dead return no more to their house. So, are there demons roaming the streets of Gettysburg? I wouldn't doubt it for a moment. Not for a moment. But are they the spirits of dead soldiers wandering around, troubling people and bothering lives? It absolutely cannot be that way. At least, not if you want to believe the Bible. I'll never forget the experience I had visiting a lady in her home a number of years ago, and she told me this story. She said that her uncle 
lived with her family in the last years of his life and that he died right there in her home. It wasn't but a couple of days after the funeral and she went back into Uncle Larry's bedroom to straighten something up or return something or retrieve something. And as she stepped into that room, music started playing. She looked around, she didn't know how to explain that. She stepped out of the room and the music stopped. So she stepped in and it started and she stepped out and it stopped and she had a little fun with this for a while and she wondered what was going on and she wondered if she was hearing things and then she realized that's the kind of music Uncle Larry used to love. That's what's going on here. Uncle Larry's back and he's telling us everything's okay. Well, you can believe that if you want to, but it's not what the Word of God says. The Bible does not tell us that the dead come back to the earth haunt houses, scare people, and roam the streets of cities like Gettysburg. In fact, that's far from the truth. It just doesn't happen. And we have that on the authority of the Word of God. The Mystery of Death is a book that will help you discover the truth of the afterlife. Death, whenever it happens, is a tragedy, and people wonder what happens next. In this week's free book, The Mystery of Death, Pastor Bradshaw explores this often misunderstood subject and provides answers directly from the Bible. Just call 1-800-253-3000. Ask for the book, The Mystery of Death. You can call any time, day or night. If the line's busy, please keep trying. You can also request this free book by writing to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91359, and we will mail a copy to your address in North America. Please note this free book is limited to the supply on hand. For immediate access, you can download a free electronic version of the book, The Mystery of Death, from our website, itiswritten.com. It Is Written is a faith-based ministry made possible by viewers like you. Thank you for your letters and your continued support. Our toll-free number is 1-800-253-3000 and our web address, itiswritten.com. Thanks for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you again next time. Until then, remember, It Is Written, Man Shall Not Live By Bread Alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.